in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It gives me a privilege to introduce the one who will introduce those who are here with us and uh, our esteemed president of the East Caribbean Conference, Pastor R. Danforth Francis. Happy Sabbath. Oh, that's better. That's better. Uh, for those who are members of the Black Rock Church, I want to tell you that I feel happy to be at home. Uh, this is going out on the World Wide Web so I can identify with the church and still be in charge of the conference. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, we are very happy that we can be hosting this Bible conference. It's an opportunity for us to sharpen our understanding of the Word of God. It is the purpose of the conference to create spiritual exercises and opportunities so that our members can grow spiritually. So tonight, I hope that we have come with open minds. That's, word, that's a word that I would like to write in your minds and your hearts. Open-mindedness. Mindedness. Sometimes we come to events like these, we come with ideas and we don't want to grow. But there's a text somewhere which says the path of the just is as a shining light, growing brighter unto the perfect day, which suggests to me there's room for learning, there's room for growth. Isn't that right? And this is why we're here tonight, to learn. And in this environment, we may not agree with everything we hear and that is quite possible and quite good but we want to we want to adopt the attitude of the billions that we would go home we would review we would check as they say on the airplanes we will cross check to see whether these things are true or not am i saying it okay for you this is what it is all about as we come to a Bible conference. We, in this context, the Biblical Research Institute of this church, we have men of God who work there. And that is the most important thing to say about these men. Men of God. Now, they are scholars in their own right. If you look at the, the profiles of them, you will see that they are well-schooled and well-educated I want to refer to them as apologists for the Bible and the church. They want to help us to understand what the Bible says and what the church teaches in relationship to what the Bible has said so that we could be better equipped to live our faith and to defend our faith. There's somewhere in the Bible which says that we should be able to give a man, every man an account of what the faith that we have. So this is what this Bible conference is all about. And so we hope that at the end of it, all of us would be able to say that we have grown spiritually. We have, create, we have gained new knowledge. I am careful not to say new light because that may have serious connotations. Tonight, as we begin this conference, we have our three presenters the director of the Biblical Institute, Dr. De Souza, Elias Brazil De Souza. Would you kindly, yes, thank you very much. Uh, he has the name Brazil in it, so you can imagine where he's from. If I think he's from the South, uh, he's from Brazil, isn't it? He's from Brazil, so he's a footballer then. <laughs> <laughs> but tonight he will be I wouldn't want to say that he will be doing he will not present tonight but I guess that the dexterity that we see of the Brazilian footballers he will demonstrate in terms of dexterity and ability to, to use the word of God and the scriptures and along with him he is the director of the Biblical Research Institute along with him is 
Dr. Steele, Arthur Steele, he's also another professor, man of God, theologian, Arthur Steele. Uh, uh, these are two present serving uh, personnel at the Biblical Research Institute. And then we have a friend, he's the one I know the best of the three. <laughs> I, I used to call him our angel, Dr. Rodriguez. He's from, he served the, as director of the Biblical Institute for many years. He's now retired, but he's still working with them. You see, it is fire in his bones. He's quite, quite a presenter, quite an quite a author. And uh, we welcome the three of them to Barbados, to East Caribbean Conference, and to this conference. Make them feel welcome. Give them a good applause. Yeah. Our presenter tonight, though, will be, if I see the program correct, the angel will present tonight. And uh, he's going to present a wonderful topic, Righteousness by Faith, and sinless perfection. I know that your minds are already being agitated even by the title. And I'm sure that after the presentation tonight, you will have a few questions. And, but you would have learned a lot. I believe that when we have our brethren from the General Conference, since we are World Church, these are our parents. And they've come to help us to grow and to guide. And we want to listen attentively. Uh, since the profiles are in the, in the brochures, I will not read what is there because I will be insulting your intelligence to read what is there already. But uh, as I said, these are men of God. These are scholars. Uh, these are men who have spent word, years in the word of God. And they are apt to bring new insights which will be meaningful. And so, as we listen tonight, as we listen tomorrow, as we listen on Sunday, I hope that our hearts will be blessed and we'll be strengthened. Before, I, before he speaks, our angel, we will have a bit of special music. Tonight our hearts will be watered by Sister Jenner Dixon. Happy Sabbath, Church. I want 
wander from your pasture Lord take me back into the fold gentle shepherd great provider for everything dear to my soul in your pasture there is man for my hungry thirsty soul there is refuge and tender Happy Sabbath to you. Are you happy today? You look tired. Are you tired? You see, I'm from Inter-America, you know, we, we have energy. Hear an amen here? Amen? Amen. It's good to be here with you. It's like coming home wonderful inter-America. Huh? The Lord has blessed our division through you, through me, through those who have given their heart to Jesus and have allowed him to use them. And this is us. Hmm? You have to talk back to me. I want to know that you are not taking a nap here, so... <laughs> I have a topic for you that is controversial. Do you like controversial topics? Well, sometimes we don't like them, but we have to deal with them. Yes. The question that every religion has to answer is a very simple one. How are we saved? This is what any religion is trying to answer. How are we saved? And the, questions, the question assumes that there is a problem, right? Because if you have to save somebody, it means that somebody is in trouble. Yes. And it is the Christian gospel that identifies very clearly the problem of the human race. You see, if you don't know the problem, you are not going to arrive at the right solution. You need to know what is the problem. And in the Bible, the problem is clearly identified. Romans chapter 3. This is the problem. Verse 9, 10. There is none righteous, not even one. Did you think you were righteous? 
that you think you reach perfection. The text says there is how many? Not one righteous. So there's something wrong with us. We want to be righteous and yet we are unable to be righteous. But the problem goes deeper than being righteous because being righteous has to do with doing things. The problem goes deeper. Life. Life. We had life. We came from the hands of the Creator with a wonderful gift. Life. It, 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 it was a form of life like no other on this planet. Created by God in a unique way. It was something wonderful. Wonderful. He brought animals from the earth. And they were alive. They are alive. Didn't they? They still have it, right? But, 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 but he created them indirectly. Are you following me? He spoke to the ground and he said, let the earth produce animals. And what happened? But when he's going to create us, no. He goes down and get dirt in the nails and he shapes us, right? And then, this is unique. No other living creature on the planet was created. This is a wonderful gift. And he gave us this gift to last for? And here comes the predicament. What is it? We lost it. You see, this is not like losing a coin. It's not like losing your wallet. This is losing everything you have. What is left is death. And death is nothing. That is to say, it's not something that you have. This death is depriving yourself from your existence. An act of rebellion. And now Paul takes us back and he says, Oh, there is no one righteous. Not one. Don't, don't, don't deceive yourself. There is not one person righteous. And he is in Romans chapter 1. He's going to describe for us the condition of the Gentiles. And he's going to tell us all those individuals, they forgot about God. They forgot to give thanks to the Lord. And they began to worship animals and to behave in ways that did not correspond to God's plan for them. And the Lord looked into the gentle world and he said, there is no one that is good. And then Paul says, let me, let me talk to you about the Jews. They have the Bible. And then Paul says, look at them. They know the truth. They know that it's wrong to steal, to commit, but they do it. So there is not one righteous among the Jews. And the conclusion comes there in chapter 4. Humans are destituted 
with righteousness. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. He's talking about the Jews. They have the law. But we have shown that they are not righteous. So now the conclusion that we have to reach is that the human race is before the throne of God, the heavenly courtroom, and they are being charged with unrighteousness. And when given the opportunity to speak, what do they do? Silence. They are guilty. They must perish. Verse 21. This is the good news. Verse 21. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. So what is he saying? If you want to be righteous, forget the law. Hey, careful, careful, careful. But this is basically what he's saying. You want to be righteous? Don't seek righteousness by obeying the law. Because sin has damaged you so much that you cannot by yourself obey God. So if God is going to solve the problem and save me, he has to do something extraordinary. He's going to manifest as a way of saving us that is not through obedience to the law because we cannot obey the law. You see, the law doesn't have power to give us life. The law condemns us, but it doesn't have power to give us life. So if we want life, you cannot go through the law. You have to go through somebody else. And here it is. Was manifested apart from the law. Verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all of those who believe. Because there is no distinction. The Jews and the Gentiles need Jesus. This is... This is the good news. How are we saved? Through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Through Jesus Christ. Here we have a human being who was righteous. Righteous. He remained faithful to God. Where Adam failed, he was victorious. And he has this perfect life, a sinless life. Sinless life. Perfect character. And he looked at me and he looked at you and he said to us, I have a gift for you. You are not righteous. You don't have a perfect character. I have a gift for you. I'm going to give you my righteousness. And I'm going to take from you your own righteousness. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, 21. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. Did you hear that? Yes. For us. That's the way it happens. The righteous one took our place on the cross so that we would not have 
to go up to the cross. Righteousness by faith. And I see him hanging there. And the spirit touches my heart and says, there, the one that should be there is you. And the spirit works on my mind and speaks to me through the scripture. And I finally say, Lord, yes, thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. Because he has opened the way for me to have life. See, the religion of Christ is not complicated. It's simple. We make things difficult because we feel that it's so simple that it would not work. It would not work. But it's very simple. I took your place. I sacrificed myself in order for you to have eternal life. In order for you, uh, in order for me to free you from the power of sin that is consuming you spiritually, physically, mentally, that pulls you down, I came to give you freedom. Mark 10.45, I have not come to serve, but to be, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. You were a prisoner and I'm going to pay for you to get out and I'm, what I'm going to pay with my life in order for you to have life. The sacrifice of Christ is enough to save us. If we really believe that he died for me, it is enough. And we call that justification by faith. We embrace Christ, the Father looks at us, and he credits to us the justice of Christ and we go home like the publican you remember the, the publican that Jesus mentioned who went to the temple and what was his prayer God have mercy on me I thought I was good but I realized that I'm not good have mercy on me and the Lord gave him mercy and the Bible says he went home justified the others came and said, well, God, thank you for all you've given me. I'm doing this, and I'm helping this, and I'm helping the other. Praise your name. You see, they, they, they brought to God their works. You following me? What did they bring to God? Their works. The other brought to God a contrite heart. A heart in need recognizing that everything depended on the mercy of God. Now, but you see, what happens after you accept Christ and embrace him and make him your see, what happens after that? You change lords. Are you following me? Yes, sir. The previous lord was sin the forces of evil. Now you said through Christ, no, but you, you cannot stay there by yourself. You see, this is a, there is a conflict. You have to take sides in the conflict. And once Jesus accepts you through faith, then you have to say, Jesus, how can I express to you my love and gratitude. And he says to us, I want to be your Lord. I am your Savior, but I want you to accept me as Lord of your life. 
because we are slave of Christ or slave of sin heading to death. There, no, a third, there is not a third option. Hmm? Slave of Jesus, serving him, working for him, sharing the message that he has given to us, growing in fellowship with him, or slave of sin. So in Romans 6, Paul says, so yes, I am your savior. You accepted me and you participated of my death and resurrection through baptism. You remember? You go up, uh, up, uh, down, uh, up, uh, uh. it's, it's, it's a very simple illustration of what being saved by faith is. You go down and you come up alive. And then you come up alive to newness. The new has come. The new is here. It's not that the new is coming in the future. It's coming in the future, but it's already a word. Here, you, came, you come from the water to something new that was not before. And now you have a past and a present and a future. In the past, I was a slave of sin, practicing the corruption of the flesh, but now, you see, this is important, this but now. Something happened. Christ came and changed me. There's newness of life. Newness. In fellowship with Jesus. And we begin the Christian life. Remember the passage in Matthew 11? This is the religion of Jesus. Listen, this, this is the religion of Jesus. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, the religion of Jesus is a religion of rest. Our life before him were being pulled apart. We were in conflict with him, with others, with ourselves. And now Jesus comes and says, I have a new religion for you. Come. And I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you. Oh, there is a yoke? Yes. What was the function of the yoke? Huh? to put two animals together to do the same job. And you put the experienced one with the inexperienced. Jesus and me. He is experienced. I am not. And he said, come, come, come. Let's just share the yoke. Come on. I'm going to teach you how the Christian life is gone. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. This is the Christian life. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to carry, and my burden is light. This is this is Christianity. You see what it is? Simple. It's the joy of walking every day with Jesus. Wake him up in the morning and say, Lord, here I am, ready to start the day. I don't know what is ahead of me, but I'm here to tell you I am your servant. Control my tongue. Control my selfishness and my pride. Be careful, Lord, help me. But we're going to hit the road this morning together. And we walk, yoked, we say that in English, to him. Tied to him. And he turns this way, he is experienced. And what do I do? You see, if you turn this other way, it's going to be painful. But if you follow him, 
A Christian life is a life of communion with Jesus. Every day. I can stop here. But you want to know about sinless perfection. Am I right? This is what. Sinless perfection. We can we will be able to claim sinless perfection once we get to heaven. Are you listening? I didn't hear an amen. You are not agreeing with me? <laughs> sinless perfection, we should, we will be able to claim it once we get in heaven. Now, I'm not, this is from Ellen G. White, so to make things easy for you. Listen to this. This is from uh, Science of the Times, May 16, 1895. She says, when the conflict of life is ended, when the armor is laid off at the feet of Jesus, the conflict is over. When the saints of God are glorified, our bodies will be glorified. Say, when the saints of God are glorified, then, and only then, will it be safe to claim that we are safe and sinless. Are you listening? Yes, sir. A couple of amen more? <laughs> Should I read it again? When the conflict of life is ended, she's talking about, you know, conflict is over. When the armor is laid off, we don't have to fight any longer our selfishness and pride. No. We put the armor at the feet of Jesus. When the saints of God are glorified, then and only then will it be safe to claim we are safe and sinless. Oof. True sanctification will not lead any human being to pronounce himself holy, sinless, and perfect. Swallow that one. It's a difficult one. So, we're sharing with you what she says. So, does that mean that we sin now? Because, you know. No. Paul says, since we were saved by grace, we cannot conclude that we can go on sinning. This is a new life. You see, in the new life, there is no room for sinfulness. But this is not sinless perfection. This is Christian perfection. And I want to talk to you about Christian perfection. I have a statement from Melanie White that I'm going to read to you because it summarizes very well what we're talking about. And I want you to listen carefully. Then after that, I'm going to get into the challenges, some of the challenges and why we have them. But I'm going to share with you my conclusion at this point. Is that okay? So that you will not be confused with what I'm going to be saying after that. We don't want confusion. So here is the statement from Ellen E. White. It's found in the Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1070. 
This statement clarifies how we are saved and how we live the Christian life, how we become perfect. Listen. As the penitent sinner, you know, who is the penitent sinner? The person who has been touched by the Spirit. Hmm? The penitent sinner, contrite before God, or contrite before God, deserves Christ's atonement in his behalf. So you have this, this, this human being, that was me and you. You know, we, 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 were, we began to study the Bible and began to understand things. And the Spirit came and began to speak to us. And our hearts melted. And we began to understand the work of Christ on me. She says, we, begin, we began to discern Christ's atoy, atonement on my behalf. And then accepted his atonement as the only hope in this life and in the future life for me. Are you following me? So the Spirit is touching me, telling me, look at the cross. Look at the cross. This is the Son of God. He died for you. And we begin to understand this. And we begin to look ourselves and we say, well, I'm so sinful. So sinful. This is the penitent sinner who says, I'm a sinner. But he says in Jesus, the only hope in this life and in the future is the only hope. He doesn't have any other hope. But when he accepts this atonement, she says, his sins are pardoned. Come on, come on. Yes. This is how your sins were pardoned. You accepted Christ as your Savior, and at that moment, she says, our sins were pardoned. And then she says, this is justification by faith. You got it? Justification by faith. Penitent, contrite heart, sees Christ, accepts him, his only hope, and the Father pardon our sins. This is justification by faith. Now, this is the other side, the Christian life, okay? Every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will. Are you following me? This is Christian perfection, okay? You don't go on living your life the way you lived it before. Now you say, Lord, what should I do? And the Lord says, keep my commandments. You follow me? You want to make God's will for you your own will? Hmm? We want to conform our will entirely to God's will. Then she adds, well, let me read the sentence. Every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will and keep in a state of repentance and contrition. Did you hear that? Yes. Keep in a state of repentance and contrition. Do you understand? How did you begin the Christian life? With repentance and contrition. And you were justified. Your sins were forgiven. And now you begin the Christian life, right? And you begin to conform your will to the will of God. You want to obey Him. But she adds, and this is extremely important, she adds that we keep in a state of repentance and contrition. You, you understand? You see, it began with repentance and contrition. You are declared righteous by faith. Now, through the power of the Spirit, you want to align your life to the will of God. But you do not live 
repentance and contrition in the past. You take it with you in your Christian life. Are you following me? You are trying to obey God. You are want to be perfect in the biblical Christian. You want to be perfect. And the Lord says, yes, that's good. But in order for that to happen, you have to keep with you the spirit of repentance and contrition. You, are you listening? This is how we become perfect. Growing in Christ. Trying to fulfill God's will. But at the same time, we remain in a state of repentance and contrition. Because the good Lord knows our nature. Do you understand what I'm talking about? He knows that our nature is a sinful nation, nature. And he knows that when you pray, when we sing, when I preach, in order for the singing, the praying, and the preaching to be accepted by him, it has, the, the three things have to be cleaned up. Because they are tainted by what? Our sinful nature. Are you following me? So you need two things in the Christian life. Every day, walking with Jesus, learning from him, submitting to his will because it's a will of love and kindness and rest. But at the same time, you stay in a state of repentance and contrition. This is what Christian perfection is all about. You grow in Christ, you align yourself with the values of his kingdom, you try to overcome your selfishness and pride and sinfulness, you try to, yes, and you will do well because the Spirit will give you victory. But at the end of the day, are you listening? At the end of the day, you have to show repentance and contrition. So before you go to bed, you have to go to the Lord and thank him because he used you today. But you also have to ask for what? Forgiveness. Everything we do is tainted by a sinful nature. You need both. If you are not growing in Christ, you are spiritually dead. A strong. I didn't hear any amen there. Huh? You grow in Christ every day. How do you grow in Christ every day? How do you do it? It's not complex. It comes through us to the study of the scriptures, the spirit internalizes those values. And we begin to look more and more like him. We struggle with our temper. We try, we, we have to learn to control our words and our attitudes. Yes, because we want to reveal Christ through us. We want the world to see in us the image of the absent Lord who is in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary interceding for us. So if I ask you, why, why do we have to, to practice this, this, this demands of the kingdom? Why, why do I have to to align my will with the will of God and, and live in a state of repentance and penitence. Why do I have to do that? Not because you want to be sinless, 
not because you want sinless perfection that will take you victoriously through the time of, of trouble. <laughs> you do it in order to excel in service to others. This is not about you. Character development, Christian perfection, is not an end in itself. What it aims us is at enabling us by transforming our character to serve God and others in an excellent, superior way. You're probably not sure about that. Let me see if I can find the statement by Ellen G. White here. Where is it? What is it? Where is it? I thought I bought it with me. Um, she says that moral perfection aims at service. So, I'm going to read to you. Is that okay? You want to hear? Yes. Let me see. Those who would be workers together with God. I'll tell you in a moment. Those who would be workers together with God must strive for, per, for perfection. Do you hear that? There is such a thing as Christian perfection. Must strive for perfection of every organ of the body and quality of mind. So, you know, you're going to be a surgeon. You seek perfection in the use of your hand in the work. You are going to be a housewife and you seek perfection in doing what you do as a housewife. That's what she's talking about, okay? Perfection of every organ of the body and quality of mind. Listen carefully. True education is the preparation of the physical, mental, and moral powers for the performance of every duty. It is the training, this perfection, she says, is the training of body, mind, and soul for divine service. Yes. Did you get it? This is not about me, that I want to be perfect because I want to do this or achieve the other. No, 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 no. This is, you, you seek to be like Christ in order to serve the way Christ served. So let me be clear here. If this is not the case, then the search for moral perfection would be a selfish attempt to be ready to survive during the time of trouble. Did you get that? Yes. It's all about me. But the Lord is telling, no, 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 no. no. It's not about you. Develop your abilities to the maximum. Become the kindest Christian that there could ever be in the world, but for one reason, service. She says, we should cultivate every faculty to the highest degree of perfection that we may do the greatest amount of good of which we are capable. Did you get it? Yes. yes. So you seek Christian perfection. To do the greatest amount of good of which you are capable. See the Lord? takes us where we are. This is the purpose of Christian perfection. 
Why we have complicated this? Well, we have complicated it mainly because Adventists believe that during the time of trouble, there is not going to be any mediator in heaven. You know, it, 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 it scares some Adventists. If there is not going to be a mediator in heaven, what is going to be? What is going to, I'm not going to be saved. Because I'm, if I sin, then I lost. So the answer to that problem given by some was a very simple answer. Ah, see what is going, what, what has to happen is this. Now, you have to become perfect, sinless perfection, in order for you to live during the time of trouble without a mediator. You, you will be perfect, you, you will not sin, so you will be saved. And they placed on us a burden that they could not carry. That's why Ellen G. White is saying, yes, you have to obey God. You have to align your, your will with the will of God. You have to do that. But at the same time, you need what? Contrition and repentance. I went through all the statements of Ellen G. White on the question of living without a mediator in heaven. I found eight different sources. There are more than eight places where she uses the phrase living without a mediator, but, but they are in about eight sources. And I took those statements and put them in chronological order. You know what I mean? The earliest one, hmm? and at the end, the most recent one. And I went through each one of them very carefully. Very carefully, I mean, the best I could do. Looking very closely at the context the context. You see, in the interpretation of the Bible, the context is very important. We say in English, do we say that in English? A text without a context is a pretext. Is that right? It's the same with Ellen G. White. You, you have to read each statement within the context. And, and sometimes she makes a statement that sounds, ooh, and then you read the context, I said, oh, this is what she means. You see, this is important. Some of our friends, they collect statements from Ellen G. White on, on character perfection, and they throw them at you. <gasps> but you see, you have to look at the context and see what is she saying with those statements. Now, I don't have the time, and you will not have the energy to listen to me going through all the statements and analyzing them. Um, in that case, it would have helped had I brought a PowerPoint presentation, right? And you could see on the screen, but in my, in my island in Puerto Rico, they say, you cannot teach new tricks to an old dog. <laughs> they say that here too? Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know how to use those things. So I have no PowerPoint, but as you have seen, hopefully, as you have seen, I have power yes. and many points. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Come on, give me something. So I'm going to share with you in the next uh, nine minutes uh, my conclusions, that, that's what I have to do. I have no time for anything else. So let me give you the conclusions. The paper 
will be made available. You can distribute the paper to them and they can later on study it more carefully. Is that okay? You have to remind them if you want a copy of the paper, you have to remind them. Now, let me tell you what I didn't find. Sometimes it's good to begin with what you don't find. Okay? So what is it that she doesn't affirm? I'm talking now about the people of God living throughout the time of trouble, okay? Christ is not mediating. Number one, she does not describe them and as having reached a state of sinless perfection. She doesn't say that they reached a state of sinless perfection. Don't, don't bother to look for it. It's not there. Okay? She does not even state that they are impeccable. This is not there. Now, that's what some people say, that they cannot sin. But she doesn't say that. Are you still with me, or are you saying, mm? <laughs> She does not suggest, even, that during the time of Jacob's trouble, they find comfort in the fact that they have been victorious over sin. They don't find comfort saying, well, I was victorious over sin. No. It's not there. She doesn't say that. She does not teach that Christ abandoned them once he finished his work of mediation in heaven. He didn't abandon us. Neither does she teach that at that moment, when Christ finished his work of mediation, at that moment, the mantle of justification by faith was removed from us. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, what makes us acceptable before God is the mantle of Christ's righteousness. And she doesn't say, well, when Christ finishes the mediation there, he said, well, I'm sorry, let me get back the mantle. And you are on your own, you have to be sinless. It's not there. Man, I don't hear any amen, so you, you must be in deep uh, thought here. <laughs> she does not state that they, believers, have to stand before God by themselves without Jesus. She doesn't say that. That's what some people say. She doesn't say that. She doesn't even imply that the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the remnant church. It's not there. The Spirit is withdrawn from where? From the world, not from the church. So, this is the, what she doesn't say. Let me say a few things about what she says. She says, that the moment when Christ stopped his mediation in the heavenly sanctuary for the human race, the moment that happens, an extremely important eschatological event has taken place. In other words, this event that takes place in heaven is unique. Let me explain. The Jesus we know is the Jesus who is our high priest before the Father. Don't we? That's the one we know. 
The Jesus we know is the Jesus whose blood is efficacious to wash every human being from sin, from any sin. This is the Jesus we know. But according to Ellen G. White, at the moment when he ceases to intercede, something of cosmic proportions have, has happened. The efficacy of the blood of Christ is no longer valid. It cannot be applied any longer to the wicked. Are, are we together? See, something happens. Jesus is changing jobs. And he says, enough. From this moment on, there is no more forgiveness of sin. This is new in the cosmos. This is new with respect to this planet. Something happened in the work of Christ. And secondly, something happened in the work, will happen in the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is pulling people to come to Jesus, right? When he ceases, the Holy Spirit doesn't have to do that any longer. And he will concentrate his energy and effort on the remnant church. And God the Father also changed jobs. Wrath is coming. But with respect to us, this shift in Christ's work does not alter in any way the way he relates to the remnant. You listening? You listening? Doesn't change it. It changed only with respect to the world. But in, with respect to the remnant, this is what happens. You see, the, the description that Ellen G. White makes in the Great Controversy and Patriots and Prophets about the experience of the people of God is majestic. She says, they are there hmm, with the threat of the extinction and they, they, they begin to feel that the Lord has abandoned them and that they are going to die. And Satan comes, she says, and tells them, you are sinners. You're going to perish. She says, they want to move them away from God. And they are struggling. She says, they are struggling. And they, she says, and they look at themselves. Are you listening? They look at themselves and what do they see, she says? Unworthiness. Did you, is that correct? Unworthiness. That's what they see. They don't look at themselves and say, well, you know, I, I have a sinless perfection. I can do it. No, she says, no, they look at themselves and they see themselves as sinners unworthy of anything. They are about to lose hope. But this is what happened, she says. They, by faith, hold on to the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. You see? You, 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 you are growing in Christ, but you are keeping yourself in a state of contrition. So, so they say, well, I, I don't see anything good in me, but I'm going to trust in him. Yes. I'm going to trust in his blood and what he did for us. And they hold on to him. And they are victorious. It's so simple. I have to stop here. Go home. And continue to prepare for the second coming of Christ. This requires from you and from me, from both of us, to live up to the message we proclaim. If I ask you, 
How can the world be prepared for the second coming of Christ? How, can, how, can that, how could that happen? Ellen G. White gives the answer in the book, The Great Controversy. By accepting and proclaiming the messages of the three angels. That's what this is about. The gospel is nested in that message. You remember Revelation 14, verse 12? Here are those who keep the commandments of God. You see, this is the moral dimension that we have to aim at constantly. And half the faith of Jesus. And Ellen G. White will interpret those two phrases in a very unique way. Law, gospel. You obey the law. You have to grow. You cannot remain every day the way you are. You want to be like Jesus and you spend time with him so you are obeying. But that goes together with what? With the faith of Jesus. The faith that we put in him as our savior. Go. Fear no more. But commit yourself to a very close work with Jesus every day. Asking him to refine you so that he can use you in a more effective way for the service of humanity. God bless you. I think there are a few, there are a few moments for questions and I don't know about questions. I, I, have, I brought with me reinforcements Two individuals here who can, after I spoke, I'm tired, they can take the questions. Now, you ask easy questions, you don't have to ask any questions, you know. This is not forced. You don't have to ask any questions. But if you ask them, uh, I make easy questions, okay? All right. Uh we want to thank Dr. Rodriguez for a truly uplifting and edifying presentation. Do you agree with that? So now is the time if you need any clarity on something you would have said, or if there are any questions pertaining to the subject. Yes. Um, you just, just show your hand. Okay, we, we have Elder Rock and then we have Brother Rawl. Yeah, the quotation, the quotation um, on, on, on service. Yes. The one, on, the one on service, yes. Yes, yes. That's the one on service. If I can find it. <laughs> I'll take another. It's uh, Christ, Christ's Object Lessons, page 330 and three, uh, 329 and 330. Christ's Object Lessons 329, 330. Is that fine? That was an easy one. <laughs> okay, that was, a, that was a good one. Yes, <laughs> yes. All right, I think I saw another hand. Brother Rawl. You started off by saying, if you want to be righteous, you need to get it off. Am I right? Yes. You ended by saying that we must forget it all. You cannot forget the law. Yeah. Well, what I meant was very simple. In order for you to be accepted by God, you cannot go through obedience to the law. Obedience to the law does not justify you before God. In other words, you cannot go before God and say, Lord, I have kept all the commandments. I deserve to be saved. No. So you have to forget in that respect. You have to forget the law. The law is not a means of salvation. Right. Now you have, to, you have to obey the law as a guide 
to the Christian life. That's what the law is. The law, law is not the means of salvation, but the guide of the Christian life. That is to say, those who are saved, they want to know how do I live the, the Christian life. And, God, and Jesus said, go and keep my commandments. That's the guide to help you. You got it? Go ahead. We understand that obedience to the law is not a holy part of salvation, but is it not a condition to salvation? Can those who disobey the law be given the gift, the free gift of eternal life? So I understand it as a condition to salvation. Now, you may say, Lord, I deserve to be saved if I keep the law. I cannot be saved without keeping the gift. Yeah, what I would tell you is this the person who is not following the will of God has not been saved. You follow the difference? The person who is the Christian, who is not obeying God, is a Christian who has not been saved. Think about it. See, what I'm trying to say is you have, you cannot make the law the instrument of salvation, but once you are saved, the law you have to keep because it guides your life, but the law comes after you have been saved by Christ. So, so in essence, you are saying, Help me here. in essence, you are saying, we do not keep the law to be saved, we keep the law because we are saved. That, that, that's it we keep the law because we are saved because we recognize what Christ has done for us and now we'll say okay because of your goodness towards us we are willing to obey you we are obeyed a little more later okay yeah I, I, I saw one hand in the back and then one here yeah. Sanctuary combines uh, true Christian perfection in a wonderful way. Um, you go to Leviticus 4, the offering for sin. It's the offering for the sin of the people of God. Are you following me? It's the offering for the sin of the people of God. These were sins committed involuntarily or perhaps because of human frailty, because we have a sinful human nature and sometimes we're trapped. Mm -hmm. These were not rebellious sins. Correct. These sins were the sins of the people of God. And through the sacrificial system, these sins were forgiven. This is what we say, what I was saying when I said, once you begin the Christian life, you want to live a life like Christ. But you will live in a state of contrition and repentance. That is to say, you will be bringing a sacrifice 
you know, Christ, for your mistakes, for sins of omission, but not for rebellion. The sacrificial system was not to expiate for sins of rebellion. And in the Day of Atonement, the Lord made a distinction between the sins of omission because of human frailty of his people and sins of his people that were rebellious. And those who committed those rebellious sin, they were removed from the people of God. So this is the, the, the same picture I have tried to paint I painted to you in order to understand how this, this works. Yes, the sanctuary is an excellent illustration of what justification by faith is, the altar, and what sanctification is, walking with Christ closely every day in a state of repentance. All right, gentlemen, right here. Yes, uh, this is a good point. She doesn't say that they were sinless, neither does she say that they were sinners. This is your point, and it's a, it's a, it's a point well taken. Uh, during the time of trouble, the people of God will not sin. Listen carefully, listen, don't, don't, don't go ahead of me. They will not sin, they will not commit sins of rebellion. They are so grounded in Christ that they will not break apart from him. Firmly grounded in Christ. But they still have a sinful human nature. They still have it. And they have to rely on the forgiving grace of God through Christ. This is important. Now she also says... Just, people, just, a, just, just a minute, I'm hearing, a lot, of, I'm hearing a lot of murmuring, just a she minute. Also, she also says that the people of God who will, the Lord will allow them to go through this experience to perfect their character. Mm. Serious. Even more, even more. Hmm? They were perfect, but they are developing a character like Christ and they will spend eternity developing a character like Christ. Now, this is for you to think about, to go back to Ellen G. White. We're going to give you the full text so that you can read it more carefully. It all, it is all center in Christ. If you move the center, you will be heading into theological problems and to also into a Christian life lacking a center. So, 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 so the key, the key, the key during the, time, during the time of trouble is the state of contrition and repentance. Right. Because even though you may not be perfect or sinless, sinless. You, there may be things, not sin of rebellion, but there may be falls, as Paul will call it. And, and you are basically saying all the time, asking God for forgiveness and and. Asking him to continue to transform you, is that what you're saying? See, uh, yes. L let me try to put it this way. Mm -hmm. All right, let's shh, shh, shh. During the time of trouble, the people of God, empowered by the Spirit, Amen. would be firmly grounded in the Word of God. Yes. Yes. Firmly grounded. So firmly that they will not be moved from their alliance to Christ. Amen. This is what we call the seal. 
being firmly grounded on the truth. Nothing will shake them away from Jesus. They have made the final decision. I am with Jesus. Yes. Now, let me tell you this. This is a decision that you have to make now. Yes. Amen. You cannot wait until that time to say, I have made my final, I'm with Jesus no matter what. That's it. That's you have it. to do that now. Yes. You have to reach that state right now. Firmly grounded in Christ. But when they are going through this experience, They look at themselves and they don't see sinless perfection. They decide then to look at Jesus Amen. and there is sinless Amen. perfection Amen. and they hold to him, yes. firmly to him. Amen. Whether they commit sins of omission or not, Ellen G. White doesn't get into that. This is what we get into. See, Ellen G. White doesn't talk about these things. She doesn't talk about whether they are sinless. In fact, she denies that they are sinless. That is, there is sinless perfection for them. She denies that. I have no problem with that. This is what she says. But she doesn't get into, would they sin or not sin? She doesn't get into that. What she gets this into is they are firmly grounded in Christ and they are depending on the grace of Christ. Amen. 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 All right. I see a hand. Yes. When you accept Christ as your Savior, a gift is given to you. And it's called the Holy Spirit. He transforms you into a new creature. He implants, to use terminology used by Ellen Weiss, he places in you new desires. Mm -hmm. He changes you from inside and it happens quickly. Amen. This is the beginning of the Christian life. So, I have I had a church member, a lady, whose husband was not an Adventist, didn't want to know anything about the church, and she asked me to speak to him. So I said to her, talk to him, and ask him whether he would like to spend a little time with me. And perhaps because of trying to show kindness to his wife, say, yeah, bring the pastor. So I went there. It was very clear. He didn't care about the Bible, he didn't care about Christianity, about Christ, about anything. Six months later, he was singing in church. Now you tell me how that happened. This is the spirit changed this person. This is what the spirit is doing constantly with us, changing us, re renewing us, transforming us into the likeness of Christ in order not to become proud of our holiness, 
but in order to serve. Amen. Amen. All right, Pastor Watts. Question. For me, the imagery of Job solves everything. Amen. Because I don't have to plow on my own. Mm. And once I stay on he will get me. Yeah. Amen. So it's not about me. But yet, I have to stay on mm -hmm. Amen. It's right. very simple. I'm going to try to allow persons who have not yet asked a question to ask a question. So I'm going to come here and then we're going to Brother Riley. That's okay. also been used by some in order to require or justify sinless perfection. What is this judgment about? Why, why, why is there a judgment? Why does God judge everybody? Because he doesn't have to judge anybody. He knows everything. The resolution of the sin problem is a very serious matter. A portion, a portion of God's creation is going to be deleted from the universe. And the Lord wants the whole cosmos to see that what he has done for the resolution of the cosmic problem is just, is right, that he is a God of love. Amen. Amen. And he's going to call me to the stand. And, and he going, he's going to display me before the universe as a person who accepted Christ as, as, as his savior, and remain the rest of his life in full commitment to Christ. Now, if I broke away from Christ, then I rejected the salvation. And in the judgment, I am condemned. But if I, during my life, I remain loyal to Christ in a state of Repentance, contrition, and repentance. If I remain loyal to him, then in the judgment when they call me a angel, you know who stands? Jesus stands. And he said, angel is here. Hallelujah. He represents me. He stands for me. He speaks for me. And he says, if you if you 
speak, if you speak on my behalf in this world, I will speak on your behalf in heaven. So that the judgment should not be a matter of worries and fears for us. The judge is on our side and our attorney is the son of the judge. You would want a better deal? Now, if you committed a rebellion against Christ and abandoned him, of course, in the judgment, that will be revealed. And then you will be excluded. But you, all of you, are walking with Christ every day. Amen. You have nothing to worry. He will continue to transform you because you are firmly grounded in his love and mercy. Amen. Those who want to talk, I'll give them five minutes at the end. All right, so we're going, to take, we're going to take three more questions. We're going to have Elder Riley, and then we have Sis, uh, Sister Sharon, and then we have my brother there, um, and, and, and that will be for, for this evening. If there's anybody that wants to speak afterwards to, to Dr. Rodriguez, you can, he says you can come and spend five minutes with him. All right, five minutes. All right, one, two, three, four, five. Elder Riley. a sin for which you have not asked for forgiveness this is a secret sin a sin that you feel comfortable with that is pulling you down and destroying your life that sin is a very serious sin it's not a simple matter it's a sin that you secretly practice and have not surrendered to Christ, have not asked him to really forgive you and walked away from it. So that's what Ellen G. White is talking about when she said, if there is in you a sin that has not been forgiven, it means it is a sin for which you have not sincerely repented and you have been practicing it again and again and is therefore a sin of rebellion against God. Now with respect to the nature of sin, those who emphasize um, sinless perfection define sin as an act, act, something that you do. You know, sin is stealing. Sin is, I hate you, things that I do. And that is true. The Bible sins, says that sin is the transgression of Hello. So this is true. But there is another side of sin that we should never lose sight of. Sin is the condition, our natural condition, the condition in which we exist. We have a sinful nature. We have a sinful nature. And that sinful nature 
will not be removed from us until our bodies are glorified. That's what, why we need to remain in a state of contrition and repentance, because we have this nature. And I pray every day, and I ask the Lord, come soon and remove this monster from me. It would be a wonderful moment when we would be able to love, truly love others without thinking about our selfishness and pride. Those two aspects of sin you have to keep in mind when you talk about sinless perfection. Sister Sharon, we're going to take that one now because, because we're, running, we're, 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 we're out of time. All right? So, but, we, but we're going to let him respond to that one. All right? You see, in, in many cases, uh, it is the way we phrase the things that tend to uh, confuse us. Um, and therefore, it is important to, to find a biblical way of, 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 of addressing the issue. Um, love is at the heart of what we're talking about. Developing a character like Christ simply means loving the way he loved. This is what Matthew 5, 48 says, you have to be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. The context is talking about God's love. He loves the good ones. He loves the not so good ones. He loves everybody. He sends rain to this and the other. So you want to be perfect, love the way he loves. You see, this is very practical, nothing uh, abstract, you know. Uh, 
with respect to our overcoming sin. See, the purpose of our overcoming sin, I said to you at the very beginning, or close to the beginning, that the purpose of overcoming sin, that is to say, of developing a character like Christ, becoming perfect in Christ, the purpose of it is to enable us to serve others. We are so selfish that without Christ bending and humiliating our pride and selfishness, we would not love anybody. But once we allow that love to come into our hearts and transform us, we are transformed not to cleanse the heavenly sanctuary, we are transformed to serve others in a more efficacious way. Amen. All right, one more, one more. Yes. that statement and there are several others that in the paper I, I, I analyzed. Um, yes, the, the people of God during that time are individuals who have confessed their sins to the Lord, who have been granted forgiveness of sin, who have been washed from their sins. And then the Spirit, when Satan is accusing them that they are too sinful, the Spirit does not allow them to remember their sins that were forgiven. They don't remember that. It's not that they, the nature was changed, it's that the Spirit does not allow them to remember their past sins. But there is one thing that they know. Listen carefully. There is one thing that they know. That even though they don't remember sinning, they see themselves as unworthy. They don't see themselves as reaching sinless perfection. They see themselves as unworthy. And therefore, they reach out to Christ and hold to him by faith. And thus, they are victorious. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. We want to thank you very, very much for your questions. And um, we want to remind you that tomorrow, sorry, in the morning, in the morning we'll be at the Old Bar